and welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, before we get started and we're allowing people to join, um, as always, I'd like to be able to kind of hear where everybody's coming from. So if you can, in the chat window in Zoom, just go ahead and open up chat and type in where you're coming from. And while you guys are typing that in, uh, we'll talk to our panelists about where they're coming from. So I'm uh, Brian Vag, and I'm coming from definitely cloudy today, Newport, Oregon. It's on the Central Coast. So let's hand it over to Dr. Elaine Ingham. Elaine, where are you coming from? I'm coming from Corvallis, Oregon. And yeah, we really haven't had summer yet. We've just <laughs> barely gotten out of spring. So it's one of those cool spring times in Oregon. And farmers are just planting for the most part. Sure. Yeah, it's been definitely wet and rainy. Mm -hmm. um, how, how about you, uh, Dr. Adam Cobb? Well, I'm zooming in from Boise, Idaho today, and it is hot and dry <laughs> and summery already here. In fact, we're, we're it's kind of like the dog days. <laughs> you're, you're in the thick of it right now. Mm -hmm. And how about you, uh, John D. Lou? Where are you coming from? Uh, I'm in actually... Um, Orange County in Irvine at the University of California in Irvine. Great. And that's always great weather down there. Doesn't seem like there's ever a bad day down in sunny South 73. California. Yeah, 73. perfect. <laughs> it's not a problem at all. And just looking at the chat, boy, we've got people again from everywhere. I love this. And we got uh, representation pretty much all across the globe, which is just fantastic. Love, love, love to see everybody joining. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. We actually have quite a few things to cover today. So welcome again to today's webinar. Uh, this is the July webinar series, July 2022. It's Rescuing Mother Earth. And webinar one is how to accelerate soil and ecosystem restoration. So that's going to be our theme or our topic for today. So uh, let's get through some housekeeping here. So we have three more webinars in this webinar series. Uh, webinar number two, which is going to be ecosystem restoration examples. That's going to be at 11 a.m. Pacific on Friday, July 17th. And uh, we're going to be exploring uh, different restoration projects from around the world. And then webinar three, which we're calling the main event, uh, saving our soils and ecosystems is going to be at 10 a.m. Pacific on Thursday, July 21st. And we've got some definitely some rock stars going to be joining us on that one. And then webinar four, how can you impact our your ecosystem? Careers in ecosystem restoration and regenerative ag. And that's going to be 11 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday, July 28th. And you'll be able to hear from a number of folks who are actually doing the good work out there, doing that kind of uh, restoration. Brian? Yes? Can I just ask a question? Because you said, sure. you said webinar number two is on the 17th. Uh, 15. Maybe I said yeah. the 17th. Sorry, if I, I did, my bad. It was, it was Friday, July 15th, not 17th. John's going, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have a conflict there. Okay, uh, let's talk about just some webinar rules of engagement. So we have quite a few folks that will be joining us today. So uh, the attendees will be muted for the duration of the webinar just to make sure we get good audio quality. It will just be the panelists uh, that will actually have uh, audio and video. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about entering your questions for the panelists in the Zoom Q&A. And I have a slide that will show you exactly what button to press to be able to enter in your questions. Um, and then feel free to converse with other attendees in chat. Chat's a good way for there to be kind of some background discussions and dialogues happening while we're actually going through the webinar. And then last but not least, uh, please enjoy. Hopefully uh, you'll be able to take quite a bit away from this uh, webinar and the webinar series. So let's talk about uh, our topics for today. So again, this is webinar one, how to accelerate soil and ecosystem restoration. Uh, we'll go through some introductions uh, so we can introduce our panelists. And then we're going to talk about what is ecosystem restoration. And uh, John's going to uh, go through that uh, presentation and video. And then we'll have the soil food web approach in four steps. And Adam's going to be going through that. And then we'll have repairing the soil biome accelerates natural recovery processes. And again, Adam's going to be uh, leading that discussion. And then we'll take a, a quick uh, intermission uh, to talk about our current offers, and then we'll jump right into Q&A. So all those questions that uh, you had been posting uh, for us during the webinar, uh, we'll pick a few of those and actually uh, have the panelists discuss them. And we expect that our webinar today is going to take a total of two hours. 
All right, let's talk about our panelists. So I'd like to have each panelist introduce themselves. So we'll start with Dr. Elaine Ingham. Well, um, I'm a microbiologist, specifically a soil microbiologist. I've focused uh, in my PhD work on what these organisms in the soil do. And it was uh, always interesting to realize that back when I first started my PhD work, that um, the other soils people on campus were like, well, you know, why bother with um, uh, understanding what the microorganisms in the soil do? They, they're they just there. They don't do anything for plants. You're not gonna have a job when you get a, finished with your PhD. And yet here we are some 40 years later. And it's very clear that that was the wrong attitude, that plant production has everything to do with how the biology matches what that plant needs. As we go um, to try to, re, uh, to reverse climate change, we want to make certain we get these organisms back into the soil because that's where the carbon came from, mostly. We have to put it back there. And how do you do that? And if you don't have any microorganisms in your dirt, you can't possibly put the carbon back into your soil. You've got to have soil. So how do we fix that problem? And we'll be talking about some of those initial steps today. Great. Thanks, Lee. John D. Liu. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm John Liu. Um, I started uh, professionally as a journalist. And uh, then I did a lot of filmmaking over time. I was 15 years as a journalist for CBS News and then Radio Televisione Italiana and Zoetis Zoetis Fanzine, among others. Then I made a bunch of films for the BBC. And something very interesting happened in the mid 90s to me when I was about 40. Um, I was asked to film a baseline study in the Lisp Plateau. So I'm going to, I became fascinated with ecology. And so I've spent the rest of my uh, the last 30 years studying ecology. I'm now 70 years old and it's uh, wonderful to be here and great to see so many people. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, John. Dr. Adam Cobb. Hi, thanks, Brian. Uh, so on this topic of ecosystem restoration, um, you know, I, I could talk about um, soils and, and my love of soils, but a lot of my direct experience has been in uh, grassland restoration work. And especially because I studied mycorrhizal fungi during my PhD, um, they're incredibly important to the, you know, you really see a lot of our grasses in North America, for example, can't complete their life cycle without mycorrhizal fungi. They simply can't get enough nutrition. So it's a topic that I absolutely love. I got to teach it for years at university, at Oklahoma State University. And in fact, um, it's always, I'm always tickled to be on a panel with John because um, maybe six, seven years ago, I found Green Gold uh, on YouTube and I started uh, having students watch it and write responses to it about, you know, how it inspired them. And so, you know, I'm responsible for at least 500 of your hits on YouTube there, John. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thanks, Adam. Um, and then I am Brian Vang. I'll be your host uh, for today in the webinar. I am a soil food web consultant. Uh, my company name is Sprouting Soil. I'm based out of Oregon, and I recently made a move from Northern California up to Oregon, so it's a, a fascinating change in bioregions and climate and things like that. Uh, but predom predominantly as a consultant, I go out and I help people who are growing plants, and that could be from residential, landscape, small-scale ag, large-scale ag, and I help transform them from growing in predominantly conventional agrochemical or organic systems uh, tra uh, transition them to growing with biology. So, all right, so that's the panelists for today. And before we get started with John, we're going to actually uh, talk about a new partnership that we have between the Soil Food Web School and what John's uh, working on is the Ecosystem Restoration Camps. And this is going to be an exciting new series of classes developed around ecosystem restoration uh, with the Soil Food Web techniques as well. And this is going to be just another tool in our tool belt to really help us uh, do large scale ecosystem restoration. 
So we're really excited that uh, we have this new partnership with John and, and we're gonna hear a little bit more about that uh, as we move through the webinar today. So let's talk about a quick poll as well. What we would like to do is hear a little bit from you and really where you're coming from. So there's gonna be a poll that gets launched and we're gonna be asking which of the following best describes you. A, I'm a farmer, rancher, grower looking for a better way, or B, I'm looking for a new impactful career helping mother nature to heal. So um, if you can, go ahead and answer that poll that's come up. All right, um, let's go ahead and also talk about the Q&A. So just a little bit about Zoom. We really have two ways that uh, you as an attendee can communicate with us. Uh, one of them is the chat, which I mentioned uh, before, and I, a lot of you have already used it to kind of tell us where you're coming from. The chat windows are gonna be really good for having the background discussions. Now, if you want to be able to ask a question to have the panel actually take that question and, and discuss it, please go ahead and click on the Q&A button, which is right down the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then we'll go ahead and select questions uh, later on in our Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And uh, again, have the panelists kind of discuss those questions. Okay, so without further ado, let's go ahead and hand this over to John to talk about ecosystem restoration and the camps movement. Uh, so John, take it away. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you, uh, Elaine, and everybody at uh, Soil Food, Food Web School. It's so wonderful to have this opportunity to speak here and also to be in partnership with you for the training. And uh, so, as I mentioned, I uh, had this opportunity to film the restoration of the Lis Plateau. And I'm gonna um, ask uh, in just a moment, because I'm gonna do something to turn off my, I can see that I may be making little beeps if I don't do that. Uh, okay, so Br Brian, if you could, if you could start the, the video, thank you and yeah. make it full screen if possible. I don't know how you do that. There we go. It should be Is, a full okay. screen now. Okay. And uh, I'll go ahead and run the video. Okay. So if you could just maybe moderate the, the volume so it's low. Um, sure. Certainly, I think uh, I have to, I'm in tremendous gratitude to the Common Land Foundation and the Mustard Seed Trust who have made it possible for me to continue to do this work over a long period of time. And what I found when I um, first uh, started to study ecology was that the, the earth was not as we found it, but it was a molten rock surrounded by gases that we couldn't breathe. And then over prodigious uh, evolutionary time, it was transformed by a biochemical photoreactive process. Uh, by co-evolved and symbiotic life forms that transformed the earth into a beautiful garden. And, and the pedosphere was then overlaid over the lithosphere. And I think this was really something that I realized that this symbiotic relationships between all living things are creating the oxygenated atmosphere and continuously renewing and, and, uh, and filtering the systems. And that's not only the atmosphere, it's also the fresh water system and it's also the soil fertility because each generation of life dies and gives up its body. And what I found was that early, early people, they just didn't know this. And they, they started practices, especially at the time of agricultural development, but there were even impacts before with driving um, large megafauna to extinction. But with agriculture, we really began to denude the landscape. And this was terrifying. And it had the, it had the, it, instead of being like, evolutionary succession with a cumulative, always more um, biodiversity, always more biomass and always more accumulated organic matter, there was always less. And so when I went out to the Lis Plateau, I found a fully degraded system 
that was also the place that had given birth to the largest ethnic group on the planet. So it was just stunning to me. And I realized that this was not only in China, this was all the cradles of civilization went this way. And so I started to consider like if human beings have had such an impact on degrading the landscape through ignorance, could they through consciousness and understanding and working together as a species on a planetary scale, change this outcome. So this is what it looked like when I first got to the Lus Plateau in the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River. And it was just sort of astonishing to think that this had any possibility of being restored. But over time, then we saw that in just 15 years, they could transform this by understanding these principles of biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, and having mass participation in doing this work. So it's, it's actually not simple. It's a totally integrated approach, which understands the role of biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, and also the importance of transforming the society to be in aligned with these natural ecological principles. And they found some really bizarre things. They could bring back the moisture in, in these areas. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that specifically because what we found was the temperature differentials between exposed soils and those which are covered with vegetation and, and have a dense uh, organic layer, the, the temperature differentials on the surface of the earth are enormous. And when this happens, it causes a, a massive increase in the evaporation rates. And so essentially what it seems to me is that this understanding the role of biodiversity, not just the role of productivity. So from the period when we've gone to agriculture, we've just considered that the point of it was more and more productivity. I think the, the video may be finished, so you can stop there and I'll just talk for a moment. Um, so uh, I, I think you can wait on that a little bit and okay. uh, I'll, I'll bring up the, the camps in just a moment. I just wanted to talk about some of the some of the things that I think I've been thinking about um, lately, because if if I look as an old journalist who covered the rise of China and the Tiananmen and the collapse of the Soviet Union and these kinds of stories um, in the in the second half of the 20th century, the late 20th century, before I started studying ecology. I look at this period and I think, well, this is a pretty dangerous period, politically, economically, socially, there's a lot of disruptions. And basically it seems that we need to have um, another purpose that, that somehow we've, the, the society is expressing the idea that um, the purpose of life is to go shopping. And that doesn't seem true to me. It just seems that um, we need to change our, our we, we need to have a central intention. And that central intention, it seems to me, is to restore ecological function on a planetary scale. And the wonderful things that I noticed was that um, in China, understanding that these evolutionary successional principles could transform the landscape, but not only transform the landscape, but also transform the society and the economy. So it's possible to affect not only the hydrological cycle, the soil fertility, the productivity and the biodiversity, but also to ensure full employment and food security. 
And then I started to think about the role of, of the ordinary people. And, you know, to, for the, <laughs> in China, it was interesting because on the East Coast, everybody was getting kind of wealthy by manufacturing and producing things for export. So all the things, the iPhones and the computers and the refrigerators and every, everything, the underwear, I mean, everything is being made in China. And so then they were getting rich, but the reaction from the, from the government was like, oh, well, we have to help the poorest people in the Lus Plateau. And I thought that was rather interesting, you know, because it wasn't like just encourage people to get rich and forget about the people who, who weren't really benefiting from materialism or, or trade. And, and I looked at, then when I saw that and I saw this transformation in comparison to the political and the economic thinking, I thought, well, the ecology is more important. No one's going to remember which government or who, who made money or which corporation had the fashionable stuff. It doesn't matter. But every, every living thing is going to be affected by what is understood and what is done in terms of aligning human behavior with what we understand about ecology. And so I was working mainly with the World Bank and the United Nations and, and, and international groups the countries, Norway and Britain, Germany, that sort of thing. And then an interesting thing happened that the, the World Bank took me out there. And when I saw that, I considered this is vastly more important than the political and economic things. And then I realized it's not just more important, it's more valuable. And so I started to analyze and think like, are we really believing in this gross domestic product and, 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 and uh, income-based value? So like, because you can break a window and then you have to have a new window and people have to put it in, but that's not really economical. That doesn't make much sense to me. So it looks to me like... Um, the next economy, the, the new economy, is a functional economy that understands the value of biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, and that human beings align with the natural systems. So then I started thinking, like, are we going to be able to do this fast enough? Because I've been making films for a long time, and I'm not sure you know, I wasn't sure that people were watching this or listening to, to this. And then I started having dreams. And in these dreams, I would wake up in the morning and I would have had this dream where I was in a camp and all the people were camping and they were eating together and they were playing music around the campfire. But in the daytime, they were studying and they were spending a few hours a day on ecosystem restoration and they were all learning about how to restore the earth and they were all working together to do that. And I shook my head because my father was always telling me that you're a dreamer. What are you doing? Get a job, act normal. And so I didn't really believe it. I didn't, I didn't accept it, but I kept having the dreams. So every morning I would wake up and I'd been in, in my sleep thinking about these camps. And so I wrote an essay. It's called, that essay is called, um, it's called Earth Restoration Peace Camps. And it was published first in Permaculture Magazine. It's a, you can find it by Googling Earth Restoration Peace Camps and Permaculture Magazine. And after I wrote that, I didn't have the dreams anymore. So that was kind of, you know, that was sort of interesting. But then thousands and tens of thousands of people started to respond saying that they liked that idea. And not only that, but some of them were saying that they were having the same dreams. So um, I thought that's odd. 
And so when we when that many people were interested, we we thought, well, let's start a, a, an ecosystem restoration camps movement, and we did. And in the in the first year, uh, well, let's look at the video. It's about five or six minutes, and take a look at this. And you'll need sound for this one. So uh, the video is embedded uh, here, John. Is it? Oh, no, it's not a video. No, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, You're right. The slide deck. Just the slide deck. I'll talk talk over it. Perfect. So let's let's carry on and uh, go to the next slide then. Yeah. Okay. So when we, we created the first camp in uh, two, 2016, and it was in Spain, it's still there. It's actually really doing quite well. And it was it was a challenge because it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in Territorios Abandonados in Murcia at the border with Andalusia. And it's a very dry, hyper-arid area that once was a beautiful oak savanna, but they cut all the trees to build the Spanish Armada. And then it was sunk really pretty quickly. So all those trees disappeared. So that kind of violence and, and so on doesn't really do very much. But then there are centuries of, of desertification. And uh, let's go to the next. Uh, so, so this, after the first year, the second year, there were two camps. The second one was in Mexico, partnered together. Somebody says you can't see the uh, videos or slides. I don't know what that means. Are you seeing it? Is everybody seeing this? I guess. Panelists, you guys um, seeing it okay? Okay. Um, anyway, uh, the third year, there were 21 camps. The fourth year, there were 37 camps. And at the end of 2021, there were 50 camps. And by the end of this year, there could be 75 to 100 uh, camps. So the camps movement is proliferating. Let's keep going. Uh, and they're, they're basically, uh, it's, the numbers are wrong because now there are over 50. And there will be either 75, there's already enough to be 75 that have applied, but there could also be a, another 25 that apply now. And so there could be a hundred. And what I've been seeing is that these can be living laboratories on a planetary scale. And, you know, if I think about the institutions that we looked at, the World Bank or the United Nations, they spend so much money, but there, it doesn't really, you know, it's, it's expensive, but it's not. So I think that the camps movement, one, it's the least expensive and it's the most effective way to, to, to restore the earth because we can think about it. In fact, I was having a discussion with uh, Casey who works, who teaches and studied with Elaine just yesterday. And he, he was saying, you know, if we just mulched the earth and we used all the people around the world, we could probably do that in a week or two. You know, I, I'm not sure if that's really true and we can't do it in sort of the natural deserts and so on. But if we, if we went to the degraded states and we covered them, we could lower the surface temperatures. So just thinking about that. So let's go to the next slide and see what it tells us. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all, it's all um, evolving. And uh, we can see that more and more camps are um, emerging and more and more people are going to camps. So the, there are several ways to support this. You can become a supporting member. So all of the people in the very beginning were sharing 10 euros per month, which is 120 euros per year. And so that's not a very big, that's not a high bar. Everybody could participate. If they can buy coffee at Starbucks, they can definitely do that. But um, then you can also go camping. So if you don't even have any money, you can go camping and, and do restoration. And if you are very ambitious, you can create camps. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, well, there is a camp 
that has been there for now 45 years. And I highly recommend that you go to Sekim, S-E-K-E-M. I think it might be, well, just Google Sekim and you'll find their, their community. And it's been working for 45 years and it's done amazing things in the most harshest, worst possible conditions. And uh, we've been, we have now two, two camps in Egypt. There are camps in Somalia and, and there's, there's work going on in Syria um, and in Uganda and Kenya and Brazil and India all over the world. So let's keep going on the, another slide. And Ethiopia, of course, my goodness, you know, let's, let's keep going. Um, well, this is, this is actually from another presentation that was given in uh, Jordan. So Jordan is looking at uh, having more camps. And I think that's really really interesting is there anything else on the i'm not sure what I'm, um let me take a look here i think we've i got think we're just, good i think we're okay. good with this so sure um there needs to be camps everywhere this is an uh, an opportunity for people to be empowered and that's really the the hope i think for of the of this is that Often there are people who say like, well, I would really like to do something, but they don't know what to do. And if, if that's the case, then <laughs> go to ecosystem restoration camps and pretty quickly you'll know what to do. And we need to do this on a planetary scale, but it all has to happen locally. So each of us can work locally and together we can work globally. So I'm happy to be here and I hope to be able to answer your questions later on. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, John. And, you know, I can already tell just from the chat, there's so much engagement. People are really excited to hear what you had to say. And I'm sure there's gonna be quite a few questions in our Q&A session that are gonna be around uh, the work that you're doing. So uh, thank you again for that presentation. Awesome. Okay, we're now gonna move on to uh, Dr. Adam Cobb. So Adam, um, go ahead and take it away. Okay. I just have to say, thanks so much, John. That was very exciting. And it, it's great. Like me personally, I have to be reminded sometimes that what we do at the school with training and resourcing people, equipping people with tools, that it's getting applied in the world. And that's so exciting too, right? We get to see our students working in agriculture, but ecosystem restoration is just such another huge um you know, pressing issue in the world. And I'm so glad that we get to, to partner together. Um, I wanna start with uh, helping us imagine something in the soil, because I often like to tell people that soil is actually like a jungle or a forest. It's just shrunk down really small where we have to use a microscope to see it. And one thing that we have been learning over the last several decades um, is the role of top predators in our ecosystems around the world. Um, Aldo Leopold, who is a scientist, farmer, poet, wrote the Sand County Almanac. I am a huge fan, um, sometimes called the father of restoration ecology. Um, you know, he recognized in his time that, you know, the wolf was not just a nuisance. And I realized that that might be a controversial statement, um, that there's a lot of people who, are, you know, dislike losing cattle to wolves or other uh, livestock to wolves. But in a native ecosystem, the role of the top predator is so important such that the removal from say Yellowstone National Park really hurt the ecosystem. And we got to see in the nineties what returning that organism did to the ecosystem to improve it. And these microorganisms in soil are much the same as the wolf. They fill an ecological role they are our tiny allies, I like to say. So could we go to the next slide there, Brian? Sure. I'm just gonna uh, lay out the steps that Dr. Elaine has developed and that, that we teach at the school, that we can look at that soil food web as part of a, as part as the foundation of an ecosystem, right? And this is a scientific and holistic approach where we assess what's missing, like the wolves were missing from Yellowstone, what organisms are missing from the soil food web. And then we can work on finding those organisms, 
a growing them, especially the beneficial ones are what we focus on, applying them, step three, and then monitoring with microscopy. And really microscopy is used at every step, right? I don't wanna give the idea that it's something you do at the end. It's, it, it's the way that we see what's missing and if we're growing the right things and before we apply, we have to, we have to do that. So we're gonna go through these steps and I'm gonna to try to explain each of them and then I'm gonna give Dr. Elaine a chance to correct me <laughs> at the end of each uh, explanation. So let's go on to step number one, Brian. Oh, I, I got to say, this is going to be covered in greater detail in our January webinar, which you can find on YouTube. Um, we spent a couple hours basically on each of these steps um, together back then. So step one is going to be finding the missing microorganisms, right? So this is after maybe we've already assessed that they're gone. And let me tell you, in most soils that have been managed by humans, something's missing. <laughs> We have done such a poor job of understanding for so long the effects of our actions, the consequences of our actions on the microorganisms. So on to the next slide for me, please, Brian. Um, the neat thing is that it's kind of relatively easy to find organisms in the environment still because we often know what the organisms we want like, what foods they like, what conditions they like, and we can collect microorganisms from organic materials because that's what they're eating, especially a diversity of organic materials. But what we teach, uh, you know, here at Dr. Elaine's method is to have a diversity of starting materials and to create an aerobic thermophilic compost pile so that the right microorganisms grow. And so it's best to gather materials from local areas in your environment to ensure that you're getting indigenous microorganisms. Uh, you know, sometimes people want to short circuit that and they want to go grab a product off the shelf, a commercial product, and say, I dumped that on my garden, I'm good to go, I put the life back. But I don't trust those products. A lot of times there's negative consequences to using them. And so I really like this method that we do here at the school of helping people gather their local microorganisms. So on to the next slide for me, please. And uh, Dr. Lane has categorized these into some um, broad trophic groups, we call them, or functional groups. And uh, in terms of their role, each organism probably has a specific role, right? There's some redundancy in what they do, but um, like the quote there that I've included, everything has a unique contribution to make. But bacteria and fungi, tend to have a very similar function in that they chew on soil organic matter and soil minerals to find nutrients. They chew on it physically and they chew on it chemically, right? They help break it down and they help to create structure in the soil, path, passageways and, and taking little crumbs of soil and gluing them together into bigger crumbs. And then you have protozoa and nematodes who kind of like the wolf or a lion are top predators and they're gonna go eat bacteria and fungi. And then those nutrients are released so that plants can absorb them. And it's a beautiful system when you see it there. Um, but like I said before, so often you don't see these, these cool protozoa and nematodes in soils that have been tilled or disturbed or chemicals have been used, herbicides have been used. You might not even see very much fungi in those, they're bacteria dominated. And so we're trying to fix our biological systems and, and have a sustainable food supply. And we're really just farming on broken soil ecosystems, right? So take us to the next step there, please, Brian. Um, as we're gathering back the things that are missing, the diversity of the materials will help bring in a diversity of microorganisms. And that is gonna create um, a system in our soil where there's, uh, an organism that's thriving in all different conditions, right? The spring is different from the summer, is different from the fall, is different from the winter. So we need a lot of microorganisms there of different kinds so that they can work in all of those different circumstances. Each, each one can find a different time to thrive. And so our compost, we, we focus on these broad categories of materials that we need some high nitrogen materials in there. We need some green materials and we need some brown or woody materials. Well, I have never heard Dr. Elaine say 
that more diversity of materials is bad, right? And can we get more likely to get the, the right foods in our compost pile to grow out all these different organisms when we have a diversity there? So I'll wrap up on the next slide for this section. Within those categorizations, we focus on the carbon to nitrogen ratio. That's how many carbon atoms are there for every nitrogen atom. And when you have less carbon relative to nitrogen, that's a high nitrogen material. There's more nitrogen in there. And then the middle level is what we call a green material. Um, and a lot of these, you know, we focus on getting fresh green materials in the compost pile because those are most likely to have living, vibrant microorganisms on them. And then we have, a, we, we put a lot of brown or woody materials with higher carbon relative to nitrogen uh, because we find especially that fungi like to eat those kinds of foods. And fungi can do, um, you know, they, they're one of the primary drivers to improving your soil structure to keeping your soil aerobic. Uh, so these are general values. You gotta understand if you're, if you're trying to build a compost pile, um, you know, even if you've gone through our courses and you're working with us, it takes trial and error. It takes experimentation to find a recipe that works for those local conditions. Um, and, and, you know, there are some materials that need to be avoided. There are some materials out there that, you know, we may discover that that manure came from cattle that were fed hay that were sprayed with a horrible broadleaf herbicide. And so that manure is contaminated, right? You've got to find a different source of manure. There's always um, something to be uh, considered in, in that regard. But just, again, this is a high level overview and, and um, Dr. Elaine, give me a, give me a, a grade here. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've done very well. There's just a, <laughs> A couple of points that I'd uh, like to kind of bring up again, if I, uh, hopefully we've got the time to allow me to do that. Um, when we're in places that are very much impacted by human beings, we find that there are no beneficial organisms left in the, well, it, it can't be soil if it doesn't have the microorganisms present in that material. It's dirt. Try growing a plant in dirt it's not going to be as success successful unless you can just pour on those inorganic fertilizers and pour on the pesticides and imagine what that costs today with the way the the price tag on uh, fertilizers and pesticides is going uh, you you just you can't buy it if you're lucky huh lucky enough to find some of it still for sale it's just not there anymore so how are we going to grow food to feed everybody we've got to get this biology back into the soil. And so how do you cycle nutrients below ground? Well, that's what we spend time teaching you in the foundation courses. How do these organisms find enough nutrients to bring those nutrients back to the plant, release them, they get eaten, the bacteria and fungi get eaten by the protozoan and the nematodes and the earthworms and the microarthropods, releasing the nutrients that the bacteria and fungi have gone out and found and pulled into their biomass. You know, how do we make certain that we can uh, have enough water in our agricultural system so that we don't have to use energy, we don't have to uh, irrigate with water that comes from possibly a contaminated area? Because of course, if you're pouring on all these inorganic fertilizers and the pesticides, a massive amount of leaching is occurring. Of the material we put onto soil or dirt is the more likely case is, um, 60 to 80% of the um, soluble inorganic nutrients are gonna be lost from your soil. They wash down the hill and now what are we doing to our sources of drinking water? We're destroying it. We're happily engaged in making the planet someplace where human beings cannot live. And if we don't pay attention to the fact that mother nature is giving us very clear notice that we have been messing up, human beings won't be here. Now, does that mean life on earth is gonna end? Absolutely not. But mother nature is gonna go and find some other intelligent creature to take our places because we're being arrogant about this relation with mother nature. 
So we have to have places that we can go and find the biology that needs to be present, put back into the dirt, so that dirt will start to be a soil again. Dirt should be, you know, dirt, dirt is basically just the sand, silt, clays, and some of the disease-causing organisms, perhaps. Whereas soil is, yep, the mineral part of the soil, the sand, the silt, the clay, rocks and pebbles, those things. But you have to also have the organic matter that feeds the microorganisms to do all these jobs for your plant. And there's seven overarching principles that we'll talk about a little bit later. So we've got to have all of these organisms and we have to have the food for these organisms to eat. And that high nitrogen, green, brown, woody is a really important understanding because high nitrogen containing materials are party foods. You want to get the temperature going, you want to get some real action going in your soil, you're going to have to have some party food to get it started. Well, green is bacterial food. And so the beneficial bacteria in an aerobic environment, that's what we need to get them growing in our compost and in our soils. And the brown woody component is for fungi to get the wide C to N ratio um, fungi back growing and doing the jobs they're supposed to. Part of which is to take that elevated CO2 that's in the atmosphere and put it back into your soil. <clears throat> if we all went out there and we started getting these uh, organisms back into the soil, we would only have to work at this for maybe 10 years. And we would have all of that elevated CO2 back into the soil from whence it came. Wow. So I think that's enough for now. Um, back to you, Adam. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, some great points there. Uh, Brian, let's go on to step two. And I, this is, I, I'm going to speed up a little here because I'm, I'm recognizing that we're running out of time. But, you know, Dr. Lane just mentioned this too, that we're, we focus on aerobic um, composting those anaerobic organisms uh, that we could find on starting materials, they're gonna be, they're gonna contain more of those detrimental pathogens and, and other um, problematic organisms. And so we don't want anaerobic conditions, which a lot of commercial compost that you could buy out there would be produced through an anaerobic process. And so we're promoting the beneficial organisms by giving them the conditions that they like right? And understanding the ecology of that so that the detrimental organisms go dormant or die. Okay, so the next slide here, uh, you know, we have to tightly control these things. I, I answer questions a lot about compost that come in from the public and maybe people that have not taken our courses. You know, I, I put out some compost on my garden and it killed my plants and, I, you know, I don't believe in compost anymore. Well, we have to control the temperature of the compost pile, the moisture, we have to understand what the oxygen is, and then we have to turn the compost pile at the right time so that those pathogenic organisms are heated long enough, right, that they get hot enough for long enough that they die or go dormant. Um, and that will, that will make the final product truly biocomplete. And then on the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the other aspects of biocomplete, because this is, this is not just a source of nutrients for your plant, this is a living inoculum for your soil. So what we want to do is match the biocomplete compost or other amendments that we're creating to the needs of the plant. Well, every plant evolved in different ecosystems at different layers or levels of succession. So um, kale doesn't have the same needs as corn doesn't have the same needs as an apple tree, right? They're at different layers of succession. And, and we go into this in more detail again in the January webinars, but we're trying to match, make sure that there's the right ratio of fun, fungi and bacteria um, in the products that we're applying. And again, diversity. We're really focused on having a diversity of organisms out there. So we need to keep adjusting the recipe of the compost and what we find over time is that the compost piles that our students are making just get better. They become a source to inoculate new compost piles, right? The biology gets richer um, 
And so it's, it's really exciting to see this as such a, a valuable tool to put back what's missing from our soil ecosystems. I think that'll cover me for section two. If it's all right with you, Elaine, I'll speed through section Just keep three. going. Okay. Yeah, let's keep going. Okay. So let's talk about application because there's a bit of skepticism sometimes about scalability. That's probably the number one thing we get. And yet in the foundation course, Dr. Elaine gives this example of a huge scale project at Governor's Island here in the US and where they made these kinds of um, specially derived composts. And actually these pictures show that the plants they were going to apply the compost to in the, the landscape, they conditioned the compost by growing the same successional level of plants in them. So it selected for the microorganisms that the, that, that, that level of, uh, that that kind of plant needed. And so pictures worth a thousand words, right? Brian, could you take us to the next slide? Boom, two years. I mean, that is a dramatic difference. When you go from dead dirt to a thriving ecosystem, you can see with your eyes how green it is on a, on a large scale. So this can be done. This is a tool that can help us succeed at basically, these large scales. Basically no weeds over there right. two years later. Absolutely, I love it. Speaking of no weeds, we have another example for those who are maybe more in the agricultural um, side of things. Uh, so the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, Adam York Farms and he was in our January webinars. Uh, really exciting to, to touch base with him on the way that he has scaled in an agricultural system, some of these principles. So Brian, we, could we go to the next slide here? And, you know, we're talking about, and I've done some conversions to, from gallons to liters, but, you know, 10 to 20,000 gallons of biologically complete liquid amendments, right? They're doing applications in the spring, three to five gallons per acre. Um, you know, on the next slide, Brian, I think they show their facility, 40,000 gallons a day that they can make. And this is high quality biological inputs that they have figured out how to scale up. So it can be done, right? And in fact, when you're talking about application, the next slide will show us that these can be pushed through kind of a traditional fertigation system. That that's one of the ways that they can be applied. So if you see those big pivot irrigators in Kansas and Colorado flying over on the plane, you see the circles on the ground. Those aren't aliens, <laughs> they're pivot irrigators. And the, you can push these biological amendments properly through there so that they coat the surfaces of the plants and protect them and bring back the biology to the soil. I think I've got one more slide here. It can also be done on a boom sprayer, it can be done in a backpack sprayer, right? This is, this is possible at all kinds of different scales. Um, so if you don't have flat ag land, if you're out climbing a hillside, doing an ecosystem restoration, maybe you want a small backpack tank sprayer, right? To, to equip the people in your, in your um, uh, eco restoration camp. Uh, the foundation courses teach about this. And uh, yeah, it's very exciting. Did you have something to add there, Dr. Elaine? I think uh, we'll just keep going. Okay. Um, and then we'll get to step four, which uh, is monitoring with microscopy. So this was what Dr. Elaine put together as a model of the soil food web the idea of a complete soil food web. Again, if you are missing something, then there is a cascading negative effect on the way that that system works, on the functions, because each organism, each functional group of organisms has a different um, job that it does, has a different way that it helps. So we wanna look through the microscope and say, is everything present? Is there abundance? You know, we don't just want one strand of fungi <laughs> in a whole sample. We want to see maybe an increasing amount of fungi as we're recovering. Um, is there a diversity? Are we seeing different kinds of nematode? Maybe predator nematodes are coming in later in the system and they have a different physical look. And so it's exciting to see them there because our, our foo web is becoming more diverse. And is there balance? Are we seeing some kind of boom bust in organisms, or are we seeing stability, right? That, the, you know, just like we could look at um, 
rabbits and coyotes and say, you know, the coyote population goes up, the rabbit population goes down, then the coyote population goes down, then the rabbit population goes up. There's a balance there. And we want to see that. We want to observe that through the microscope um, over time by taking proper sampling. That, that's all taught in our CLP courses, um, the certified lab techs. You can set up a lab to do these assessments. And, um, and you can also, as a grower or a consultant, learn how to help other people uh, correct issues that arise in their, in their soil food web um, because maybe they did something by accident that, that caused harm to one of these organisms. Well, we got to put it back. We've got to put it back. I think I have one other slide in this section, Brian, which is just, again, emphasizing we have to monitor these outcomes over time. Any application that you make, you want to see what it did. Don't just put don't just spray and pray, right? We want to actually observe what happened and then see that those missing organisms are replenish. And we want to function, we want to focus on the functional um, level, not specific species, right? Maybe it's interesting to dig into what specific species you have if you see something really unique, but really bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, those are the big four that we emphasize because each is filling uh, a, a different role um, in the ecosystem. So I think that brings me to the end of the four steps. And we have a little time if I missed anything, Elaine. Um, you know, somebody asked, uh, you know, when we put on all of that um, compost tea or compost extract, if we aren't um, messing up with the water cycle, what happens is these microorganisms, when they get into the soil and start forming structure, they hold water. They let water infiltrate dip, deeper and deeper and deeper. And like you think about a corn plant, how deep do the roots of a corn, corn plant actually go? Well, as much as maybe 12 to 15 feet, not inches, feet. And if you're storing and holding water in that much of your, um, of your agricultural system, you've got stored water from your springtime rains, from snow melt, from you know, midsummer thunder shower storms. You're holding on to all of that water. It's not running off, it's not being lost. And so your roots grow down and they're gonna eat the water. So yeah, we put on a few gallons of tea or extracts, but it's going to be more than offset by the uh, water that you don't have to apply in the middle of that dry, dry summer period, or when we're having droughts for a long period of time. We reduce the water use in uh, agricultural fields in Australia, for example. We reduced water use by as much as 70%. And so vineyards that hadn't grown any grapes for a number of years because they just didn't have enough water we didn't bring in more water from outside. We just kept the water that um, was released on that soil, we made sure it got down into the soil deep. So, you know, a lot of these questions, um, there was a question about diversity. We build diversity all the time and we try to get back up to the same amount of species as mother nature originally had there. We kind of hope that we can get guidance from the old growth forest. We can get guidance from the um, highly productive perennial uh, grasslands. And we can get those organisms and replenish them back in these agricultural systems that human beings have destroyed their soil. So we can get that diversity back to the maximum that we can possibly get it. There are places on this planet where the destruction has been totally complete. And we're missing the natural sets of microorganisms for that part of the world. Well, we're just gonna have to take microorganisms from outside that area, bring them in, see which ones can adapt, see which ones can do the job. And we kind of are dependent on evolution taking us back to giving us that diversity. But you have to have the diversity of all of these organisms in there to allow that to happen. So we're thinking about all of these processes and how do we 
maximize our ability to reverse the damage that we've done to our planet. Well, you have teed me up for the last section here. <laughs> I'm going to refer to what you've said. So I just have to say on a personal note, this is why I'm here at Dr. Lane Soul Food Web School and not somewhere else in the broad movement of restoration or of regenerative agriculture. Because I spent a lot of time learning about the ecosystems of the world and agro ecosystems and how climate and different kinds of habitat, different biological patterns influence those. And I think we have to take action to manage those things when we're in charge of land or when we're, when, when we're responsible for land, I should say. And, and I've learned a lot about the practices that are out there, what plants to grow, how to do different kinds of inputs, the timing of things. But I always felt like the keystone was missing from the equation. Well, Brian, if you'll take us to the next slide, the soil food web is the keystone. <laughs> Anything else that anyone else is advocating for is doing in terms of practices, in terms of how to manage ecosystems, I can accept all of it. It's all valid and useful. It's a big tent movement and people have the different focus that they have. But to me, as an ecologist, when I got here and took the foundation courses myself, I said, aha, this is the thing that holds it all together. If you ignore the soil food web, if, if, if you like, uh, like some of those professors that Elaine spoke to when she was in grad school say, what use is that? Then it's gonna fall apart. The arch cannot stand without the keystone, right? It is not just a foundation, it is the capstone. It is the, 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 the crown jewel, right? <laughs> Gotta get that right. So um, Brian, if you'll take us to the next slide. I just wanna show you why this is so important to me. So the last project I did, research project I did before coming to Soul Food Web School was with the USDA. And believe it or not, despite their historical um, perspectives, the USDA has gotten really interested in microorganisms. And so this was just one component of the soil food web that I was testing, which is mycorrhizal fungi, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. See this, these five um, pots in the background, that's grown in soil that has mycorrhizal fungi, native, diverse mycorrhizal fungi. And the same plants in the same greenhouse, in the same soil, the only difference is that we removed the AM fungi from the soil. And look how tiny they are, right? It's like, do we need more examples? This is just one piece of the soil food web that again, we're told a lot of times, what good is that? What good is mycorrhizal fungi? Just put some more fertilizer on, right? But the difference between these plants growth is just striking to me. And in my next slide, I'd love to introduce something that you know you can go verify this for yourself. It's it's been assessed and it's in the scientific literature that if we look at the relative biomass of life on this planet, that we are a tiny sliver of it, we humans. Like look at the influence we have on this planet. Yeah, we are 0.01% our biomass of the total. And even all the animals, this includes, you know creepy crawly things. This includes stuff in the ocean, mollusks. It's still a tiny percentage. Look at how much plants dominate the world. Their biomass is everywhere. Well, think about that last picture I showed. What would the plants be without the microbes, right? Even though microbes are 17.1% of the world's biomass, they facilitate so much of the growth of plants. You know, I, I, I'm a believer that we wouldn't even have plants on land without microbes. They, they simply couldn't have found nutrition in those early, um, mostly dead, you know, dirt that was here yeah. until Very it was colonized true. by the microbes. So, yeah. yeah. And then this is a quote by Ed Young. I, I, I love this one because, um, you know, if I was to put my quote down here, it would be to say, looks like Dr. Elaine was right all along. <laughs> The microbes are important. People are waking up to the, to the importance of, of managing these things that have been so hard for us to see and understand. And yet we know that they're critical importance. So it would be 
such hubris for we as humans to say, the nematodes are missing, but what good are they? The protozoa are missing, but what good are they? Right? We, we need them. They, they uh, are more important than we are to the way the world works, right? So my last slide is just mentioning some of the, the, oh, second to last slide, I should say, some of those benefits. So this section is about how to accelerate the process. Dr. Lane mentioned some of this. We build soil structure and water holding capacity. The microbes store carbon below ground. They retain the nutrients so they aren't lost to the waterways and pollute downstream systems. They protect the plants and give them um, nutrition out of the soil. We see a reduction in weeds, diseases, and pests, the, the outbreaks of these things. And you know, you go to a good healthy grassland like this one and you go, hmm, there's like three or four weeds out there maybe. You know, some little spot where something trampled an area and gave them a chance, but it's just full of beautiful, um, you know, critical species, beautiful flowers and all. The microbes also help decontaminate the environment. So if it historically um, was an area that got salt contamination or something else that we're having to restore, the microbes can help to lock that up and, and um, that, that thriving soil biome uh, can do that. So ultimately, we're talking about planetary and human resilience. The stressors are mounting in the world. The pressures that we're putting on the natural environment are melting. The pressures of the climate change that we're helping to cause. And yet this is a way to make those systems more resilient, ultimately supporting not just the beautiful biodiversity of our planet, but also us and our society. Because I'd, I'd like society to be here in 30 years, <laughs> personally. So my last slide, Brian, is just reiterating that concept of resilience and another quote by Aldo Leopold because just about everything I've read of his is brilliant. We abuse land because we see it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. That's really what I hope the message comes through clearly in, and I heard it in what John shared um, and, and what we teach at the school. Great, that's fantastic, Adam. Uh, and Elaine, any uh, last comments you want to make to uh, to what Adam wrapped up with? Oh, I hope that people um, feel like they, they have the need to come and take some of our foundation courses so that uh, you can realize how important these organisms are and how different they are in different parts of the world. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people like to you know, take soil because, well, my plants are growing really well and ship it off to friends someplace else and they try it and, well, no, it doesn't have any good value or has very little because the organisms are different in Texas as compared to New York, for example, or uh, any other place on the planet. So we really need to be um, dealing with, using, promoting those naturally occurring organisms that are present in a biome. Mother nature has had the last billion years since plant rooted plants were um, came uh, uh, upon this planet. And so a billion years of practicing to get the exact right sets of microorganisms present in that soil. We need to honor nature and use the local indigenous sets of organisms and not try to bring some something from thousands of miles away and hope that that's going to fix our problems. We have to stay local. Right. So on that note, great, on to you. Great, great words uh, to, to close us out with uh, Adam's uh, presentation. And so we're going to move on to the Q&A section. But before we do, we're going to actually look at a, uh, a, a promotional um, video talking about our current offer that we have in July. And uh, after this, we're going to go ahead and uh, start working with the panelists and going through our questions. So without further ado, let's talk about our current offer in July. If you are looking for a way to make a big, positive impact on the environment, the Ecosystem Restoration Bundle could be for you. Whether you're a farmer or agricultural professional looking for a way to transition to regenerative ag without harming profits, 
or someone looking for an impactful new career as a soil food web consultant, lab tech, or compost producer, or if you're someone who is really passionate about ecosystem restoration, this bundle has a lot to offer you. We've put together four really powerful tools that will set you up for success, enabling you to make an impact on the soils and ecosystems in your part of the world. Tool number one, the Soil Food Web Foundation courses. This is where you'll learn all about how soil functions on a biological level. You'll understand what the four key groups of microorganisms are and how they work together with plants, nurturing and protecting them. You'll learn how to make biological compost and liquid soil amendments and how to apply them to soil so that the soil biome can be rapidly restored to health. These are all great skills to have at your disposal if you are working on regenerating farmland or an ecosystem restoration project, as repairing the soil biome will dramatically accelerate the regeneration process so you can start to see the results in the first growing season. Tool number two. The Introduction to Ecosystem Restoration. This is where you'll study ecological principles and ecosystem restoration techniques. This course will prepare you to make a meaningful contribution to any ecosystem restoration camp where people are coming together to restore their landscapes. Please take a look at the Pathways video for more information on this. This is a great tool to have in your box if you are a soil food web consultant working with farmers to support their transition to regenerative agriculture because it will empower you to have a positive effect on the wider ecosystem beyond the soil biome and cropland. You'll be able to have a positive impact on streams and rivers, on woodlands, and on the animals that occupy the local area too. Tool number three, the Certified Lab Tech Program. This is an intensive three-month program designed to help you to master Dr. Lane's microscopy technique. You'll work one-on-one -on -one with a microscopy mentor in eight one-hour sessions. This is such a powerful tool because it enables you to measure the success of various techniques that you might be experimenting with on your own ecosystem restoration project or farm. You will be able to see how the soil biome responds in weeks, way before you start to see above-ground responses to the strategies you are using. And you'll be able to assess the quality of your compost and liquid amendments, so you'll know how impactful they could be before you put in the effort of applying them to the soil. This is kind of like having x-ray vision that enables you to see what's happening beneath the surface of the soil. It's a real superpower. <laughs> Tool number four, the introduction to permaculture. Permaculture is a regenerative design approach that can be applied to just about anything from water management, growing systems, dwellings, and much more. This is another great tool to have in your box as permaculture principles can add tons of value to any project. This July, with the Ecosystem Restoration Bundle, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses for just $3,800, saving $1,200, and you'll get these other three powerful tools absolutely free, saving a total of $3,800 off. That's an incredible savings of 50% off the total bundle value, which is $7,600. We're putting these four amazing tools together because we really want to set our students up for success. Whether you're a farmer looking to transition to regenerative ag while having a positive impact on the wider ecosystem, a budding soil food web professional, or someone who wants to dedicate themselves to the cause of ecosystem restoration, these four tools combined will give you a great foundation. Come join the soil revolution today and be a part of the soil solution. Okay. If you are looking for a way to Sorry, make a everybody. big... Let me get out of the screen here. Okay, next slide. If you... All right, so we're going to move on to Q&A. Um, and just to talk about the promotion real quick, I'm always amazed at, at how much we continue to keep on adding content. Uh, it seems like uh, as the years go by, just more and more information that we're adding to our programs, which is fantastic. I know for a fact, from being a consultant, um, it really does help um, having that knowledge or those additional pieces of knowledge going out there and working with our clients. So bravo to the Soul Food Web School for continuing to keep on uh, adding content to the, the curriculum. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get into q and I'm always excited about q and I'd love to hear from the panelists. So panelists, I think you're all off mute except for Adam. I think you're, you're still on mute there. Uh, let me go ahead and share up my screen. 
and we're going to get to the first question. Oop, uh, let's see. I'm not seeing the questions come up. Oh, here we go. All right, now we're going to be in a good spot here. Okay, so the first question, panelists, is and this one's from Tom. How do we reach a critical mass for these kinds of projects to make a real difference for the planet and reach out to as many people as possible? What kind of organizations are needed to connect the many tens of thousands of different projects and initiatives worldwide? So scale, how do we get this information out at scale? Who wants to take this uh, question first? Well, it's, uh, I guess I will. <laughs> sure. And what, who was that? Who else? Was uh, John, John, I think it has something to say as well. I think the two of you for sure are dealing sure. with things at very large scale. So uh, really looking forward to hear what you guys have to say. Yeah. So I was basically going to say, well, obviously John's work is being done at very large scale in lots of different ecosystems all around the world. And that helps us understand the variations that occur in how plants grow in different parts of the world, you know, temperature and moisture. And when does spring start? When does the summer um, start? And you've got to understand all of those factors um, when you're trying to bring your herds of microorganisms along so that the, the correct ones are present and functioning under those conditions that select for them and not against them. Because if the system, if the ecosystem is not something that this bacterium can grow in, it will either die or go dormant. And that's not gonna be helping your plant. So we've gotta make certain we have all of that diversity of microorganisms present. Um, and then we've got very large scale methods of getting the compost made, getting the extracts out, we work with uh, you know, people who have you know, 10,000 hectares, um, 50,000 hectares. It can be done, but it, there's going to be a fair amount of equipment involved in it, or you're going to have to hire herds of human beings to do that work. And you know, maybe we'll go there, but currently it, there are machines that help us um, get all of this or the biology out into the soil at the right time in the right place and to the right depths and up on the foliage. So we, we can do this. John? Yeah, well, if I were to add something to that, I would say that um, in some ways, the whole concept that we've come up with about um, economics and differentiation of class and race is, is connected to this. So we have large numbers of refugees around the world. We have large numbers of homeless and unemployed people. What are they doing? Why don't they learn this and participate in this? And why don't we understand that this is more valuable than buying and selling stuff or these other, these other things that are, you know, I mean, there, there are things, casinos or pornography or, you know, what is that? That's supposed to be increasing the, the economy. What we need to do is all realize and value human beings and realize that you don't actually buy your human rights. You have your human rights. And because you're, you're a representation of all life since the beginning of time. And so we need all people to participate. This has to be the central intention of human civilization. And if, if restoration of ecological function on a planetary scale is the central intention of human civilization, we can't even fail. And if, if, if that, so it, we, we transfer away from the idea that we're consumers or, or even that we're workers and producers, we're living our lives. And in living, we need to understand, I mean, there was one question I noticed in the Q&A about spirituality. And, you know, I think we're, we're, we're both physical and spiritual. And the fact is we're gonna die. So we better look at this before that. <laughs> we better consider our spirituality while we're alive 
and we better consider what is the purpose of our life. And what I've found in, in uh, learning about ecology and working in restoration is that it's very satisfying. And that's where the beauty is. And, and it's also more valuable. So we're going to have to change the economy, change the, change the world, and change the paradigm. And so doing that is satisfying, and it ultimately is more valuable. And so ultimately, it will be rewarded. We need to have a, a little faith. Great. Adam, anything you want to add? I think John has said very well that there's a perspective of abundance and hope that's available to us instead of a perspective of scarcity and lack that the economy, the, the systems that we exist in offer us. And I, I personally, when I look at nature, I see abundance and hope. So let's partner with that. There is no place on this planet that we can't grow play, plants. And all the places that you're told that you can't grow anything here. In Southeast Asia, we're over there right now um, going to some of these places that they've been told, they tell us that you cannot grow anything there and it will never grow anything from this time forward. And then we go in and we put the right biology and plants start growing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the lie is being threatened. We can take anything that's got sand, silt or clay and we can turn it into a good productive ecosystem that will nurture the human beings taking care of it. Agreed. And I think we have so many examples where we're able to do this on a large scale in eco, uh, ecological restoration, in large scale agriculture. Um, this can be done, like you said, anywhere. And with any of these growing systems, we can make that transformation. It just really comes down to the will of the, the people as well as the people who are running our governments and, and uh, the regulations and things like that. So um, I agree with you. There's a lot of hope that uh, we can make this work. If I could just add one other thing, I would say that actually we need to empower everyone. So like if we give up our sovereignty and we say, well, somebody else is in charge and we have, you know, we are just waiting here for us to be told what to do. We're not actually taking responsibility. But if we work as communities, if we all work together, and for instance, I've been noticing how many people are hungry in California and how many people are wandering around. I, I, I actually have a, a 2007 Subaru Outback with 230,000 miles on it. And I, so for, as I've been trapped in, in uh, the United States by COVID, I've been driving up and down the coast of California and staying in different ecosystem restoration camps. And I see lots and lots of people who are, who are struggling. Why don't, we, why don't we create central kitchens and creator spaces and feed these people and engage these people and train these people so that they can, they can have a livelihood and they can have a community and they can be psychologically and physically healthy, and they can participate in the great work of our time restoring ecosystem function on a planetary scale. Now, I think if we just do that, then we're, we're going to see things changing. And, but if we, if we keep saying, well, I, I, don't, I, I can't deal with that problem, you know, and, and what I've noticed with restoration is we have to go to the worst place. What Elaine said is true. We can grow things in places that nobody knew they could grow things. I've seen uh, a, a shelter belt built through the second largest uh, shifting sand desert in the world. I would never have thought or tried that. You can find it at uh, Cosmos Journal. I think it's called the Green, the Great Green Wall of China. Somewhere it's somewhere it's published. The Great Green Wall of China, John B. Lee, and uh, it's it's amazing to me that you could do that. I wouldn't necessarily do that, but the fact that you can do that definitely suggests that we could restore all the degraded lands on the planet. So that's, that's, that's me. If the Sahara uh, Desert is not gonna be a problem, if we <laughs> get the right microorganisms in there, we can do it. 
but you can't just dig a hole and plop a tree in there and cover it up and walk on. Uh, sorry, you've got to worry about where is that tree going to get its water. And so that means we've got to start on a smaller scale. The so last have, thing to go in is trees. Elaine, we have two camps in, the, in, in Egypt now, and we have a major project starting up. You can look at the Holy Grail of Restoration uh, if, you, if you want to look at that. And... Uh, and see how that's happening. That's already now six years in development. So it's moving rapidly. And we, we need yep. you to come and, uh, and pump it. I'm ready. I'm ready. Anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, uh, great question. Thank you for the answers, panelists. Uh, we've got another question that fits similar to this, but it gets a little bit more into the nuts and bolts. Uh, this one's from Ruth. Are you aware of any large scale ecosystem scale examples of applying compost teas? Here in BC, British Columbia, Canada, uh, Canada, they do applications of pesticides and herbicides like glyphosate from airplane over whole forest ecosystems. I've always wondered about using a similar application method for beneficial products to help restore the biology instead as a starting point for large scale restoration. Yeah, and it's, you know, large scale just means you have to have a facility that you can make uh, adequate amounts um, and you have the clients um, ready to take those. So when we're working with a really large scale um, um, companies in Southeast Asia, for example, we've got the, all the methodologies put together and they work. You can switch from flying glyphosate over a whole forest ecosystem and killing all of the organisms, except for perhaps some of the plants. Um, you know, glyphosate is basically a sterilant. Just because it doesn't say so on the label doesn't make it not a sterilant. And so we've just not been told the extent of damage that occurs because of the application of glyphosate, for example. We just don't. Now, um, on the several other chemical uh, things that are being applied out there that are just frightening in terms of the, the devastation that they are putting into the land. Um, so we can do it. We have those methods. Um, come work with us and you can learn those things. Well, I, I love that uh, idea for the Sinai Peninsula. It's 700 and so it's over 700,000 square kilometers. So it's about uh, the size of um, Netherlands and Belgium combined. So it's twice the size of the pilot project in China. And it has three weather systems which meet there. So it's like an acupuncture point on the earth. And it's been so massively degraded that it's basically not there. But I think if we, can, if we can grow the microbes, we can definitely get the water and we can definitely get the biomes because there are botanical sanctuaries where we can get and massively propagate. So we, we can basically do this if, if we try hard. It's not gonna be easy and it's gonna take some time and a lot of work, but it's certainly worth it. It's worth it for future generations. And, and that's, the, that's the land of milk and honey. You know, so yeah. let's- 2,500 let's years ago, it was the yeah. land of milk and honey. And so let's fix it. Mm -hmm. Humans destroyed it. Humans better put it back together. And I think there's some really good, tools and technology that we can use to help us in this fight too. You know, just in, in the idea of using aerial spraying is one thing, um, but then also when we plant plants, we have the ability to inoculate those plants when we plant them. And why not also take a, advantage of all the animals that are in that ecosystem? They are good carriers of, of distributing microbes throughout the environment, uh, making sure that where they're at, they have access to the microbes on their hooves and in their guts and, and spreading that microbiology as well. So yeah, we can do this. All right. Any uh, other ads, Elaine? Oh, uh, there's a comment on the chat of uh, that what we're talking about is inspiring. And have we thought about taking this message to politicians and uh, people in the government? And absolutely, we have to. We've we've got to 
have a set of people that that's their job is um, influencing politicians and um, government workers so that, um, you know, 45 years ago, they didn't even know the organisms in the soil were important. And so there has been a massive amount of education, but we have only still, we've only begun. All right, uh, let's move on to our next question. Uh, next question is from Rebecca. And the question is, can you speak about soil health and the impact on the nutrition slash integrity of the food that is grown? Further, what is the connection between soil health to human health, environmental impacts aside? Thank you. Well, the connection between soil health and human health is if you don't have healthy soil, you're not gonna be able to get the nutrients that you need in the plant food that you're eating. Um, if you don't have soil health, uh, the food that you're feeding your animals and you're hoping to make a, you know, a, a nice dinner of protein, uh, the nutrients aren't gonna be there. And so we have to go back to the basis of really everything in terms of where do you start? And we've gotta get soil health back into, um, back in, into that soil. And, it is the uh, function of the microorganisms to get those healthy nutrient cycling going. It's like, um, I'm gonna get a little specific here, but I hope it's not too horrible for everybody to have to listen. But when you think about a plant, as it's growing, it's putting out exudates that's mostly carbon or um, uh, energy from photosynthesis uh, coming into the plant, being bundled up in those carbon, carbon bonds and then those exudates are released out into the soil. And basically, and I'm being anthropomorphic here, but uh, basically those are messages to the microorganisms surrounding the root zone of that plant. If you don't have those microorganisms present in your soil, the messages are going to uh, fall on deaf ears. There is nobody there to follow the instructions of a plant is giving those microorganisms. So the bacteria and the fungi make the enzymes to pull the nutrients from the organic matter, from the sand, the silt, the clay, the rocks, the pebbles, break those big boulders down into the sands and silts and clays. And it's an ongoing, never ending process that's occurring and more than enough nutrients for your plants being replenished every year. So the bacteria and fungi are pulling those nutrients into their bodies. And that's storage. It's like having a pantry right around your root system. It's not until the predators are attracted into that root system and those predators come and eat the bacteria and fungi and because the nutrient concentration in bacteria and fungi is so much greater than what the predators need, that the predators are pooping out. They are releasing back into the soil solution. The, the nutrients in proper concentrations in a form that the plants can take up. All those nutrients that were present in the sands, the silts, the clays, et cetera, the organic matter, plants can't take those up. They don't make enzymes to do that, but the bacteria and fungi do. And so the plant gets the nutrients that it ordered, kind of like, you know, the pizza parlor and the pizza uh, boy comes and, and drops off you, the uh, proper um, pizza right at the doorstep of the root. And the root says, thank you very much. But, you know, I got you got you brought me all the phosphorus I need, but and you got brought me all the nitrogen that I need, but you forgot to bring the sulfur. So go out and get me some chromium and maybe some sulfur, give me some, all the nutrients that the plant wants are available. It's just the plant doesn't make the root, the um, materials to break down and pull those nutrients inside its root system because the plants with roots didn't occur on this planet until after all of the nutrient cycling systems were established in the soil. The plant didn't need to make those enzymes there was a large burgeoning community of bacteria and fungi, protozoan, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, and all those wonderful, cute little critters. And we'd love to teach you how to count your own and determine whether you have those organisms in your soil. 
that will feed your plants with the proper nutrients. Now, a lot of people think that that's just, that's the only way plants can get their nutrients. No, um, Andrew, uh, Adam talked about um, the AM fungi, the vesicular uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi or the ectomycorrhizal fungi, or there's a number of different kinds of those fungi that form the symbiosis where the plant tells the fungal hyphae that are living in between the cell wall and the cell membrane plant tells those fungi exactly what it needs. And the plant and the mycorrhizal fungus goes out and finds it. Most of the time it's going to be, you know, phosphorus or nitrogen, something like that. But that's bringing back to the plant, the nutrients the plant re, uh, requires. And you saw the picture where we didn't have mycorrhizal fungi and where we did. Well, there is yet another mechanism that's been discovered by um, researchers at Rutgers University, Dr. James White, where, uh, well, I can go through all of those. I, I get too excited about, it. here's the actual me mechanism. So there are, and just because we found three of the methods, is that all that's there? We've only begun to understand all of this. And so maybe there are, I, I don't know, 10 other different ways of getting nutrients into your plant. And perhaps we ought to find out about those so we can make the job of growing plants easier and easier and easier. So structure in the soil, all those, the seven points that um, Adam went through, does everybody know the mechanisms for why and how those work? And if you don't, please come take the foundation courses. Uh, one thing I would add is just, you know, working with a lot of clients that have really transformed their soils to having a functioning soil food web. To a T, almost all the clients that I have, one of the things that they're most impressed with is that the changes in the quality of flavor and taste of the crops that they're growing. And I, I really think there's a super strong correlation between the flavor and taste is because our bodies are actually saying, yes, you're getting the nutrients that you actually desire. These are more nutritious plants that we're actually consuming. And then that's just, again, transitioning to then human health because we're actually getting the nutrients we need and not being nutrient deficient. That's why I didn't like tomatoes until I was 18 and had one out of my aunt's garden. <laughs> you're like, and then I what? said, this is a real tomato and I've been eating some kind of 3D printed paste. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, John, anything you want to add? Well, I, I think that um, communities are critical and coming together, working as a community. So I notice there are a lot of questions about urban areas and, and different types of biomes. And basically, each place has to deal with its, its own specific issues but mm -hmm. there are principles and mm -hmm. working together and then also creating like i think the soil food web and i think the ecosystem restoration camps to me this is a a lot about um having a mycelial network for human beings so it's it instead of just a, a, a my, mycelial network for for um fungi communicating and relationships between the plants, the bacteria and the fungi, we need to relate with one another and we can start with our neighbors and gather together and we can, we can restore front yards and backyards and side yards. There's a beautiful project in Hollywood called the, the birdhouse. It's one, it's the first urban ecosystem restoration camp. I highly recommend you go there and uh, or learn about it you can see it online and um, they're they're diverting gray water and restoring a biome and so while other parts of la are just dried out this place is dripping and it's filled with amazing biodiversity and people are having fun they also have the the hollywood uh, orchard where they glean food from all the movie stars and directors fruit trees which all come on at the same time and they can't possibly eat it. So they, they go and they pick all the food and take it down to the women's shelter and they take it to the food banks. And so fresh food, wonderful organic fruit for everybody. So 
we, I think we can do all that kind of stuff and at the same time learn more about the science because we're not going to actually learn all about it today. It's too, too complex. You're going to have to, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So be, be aware of that. <laughs> Okay, uh, it's great uh, comments there, panelists. Let's move on to another question. Uh, this question is from Anon Anonymous. <laughs> and uh, the question is, Elaine mentioned getting carbon back into the soil. I read research on soil organisms emitting methane, having a net negative impact on climate change. How does this work? Well, it can't be soil if it's anaerobic. And the only way you can, the only conditions that allow for methane to be produced is if you're in an anaerobic condition. Most uh, people who grow plants have had you know, lots of encounters with anaerobic places in the soil. It's where compaction is. When you run a tillage, anything, any tillage equipment through your soil where the um, iron plates are pushing down on the soil, you know, they're being pulled along, but they're also pressing down on the soil, you're forming a compaction layer. And so oxygen can't get through into the lower levels of the soil. And if there is also too much water down there, you've got methane. And it's certainly not going to help your plant at all, because all of our plants growing in terrestrial systems, all of our plants are obligately aerobic. The root systems will not go into the soil if it's uh, below about six parts per million oxygen. So you noticed uh, right at the beginning when um, Adam was uh, talking, he was always emphasizing that this has to be aerobic. Um, we've got to set the conditions that will promote the beneficials and not the problem organisms. And so problem organisms are things that make methane or they make really low pH organic acids. And yep, it's a great preservative, but uh, you probably don't wanna eat that without diluting those uh, anaerobic byproducts because it doesn't do your digestive system much good. So um, we wanna make certain that we uh, get rid of, that we deal with the problem of compaction in your soil. And the way to do that is to get these aerobic organisms down through the profile, inject them, or uh, you know, uh, have roots of plants start to grow deeper and deeper and make certain that they are carrying with them some of the microorganisms that they need to build structure in the soil. So structure comes first. It's uh, hard to have a, a good set of bacteria and fungi growing if they don't have any houses, no place to go of a Saturday afternoon and enjoy life. So we have to set those, the, the conditions in the soil have to stay aerobic. And we will never have methane being produced if we follow that understanding that we've got to have adequate oxygen in our soil, okay? Great. Yeah. I have nothing else to add. Uh, Adam, John. I'd love to say one thing about tipping points. So a reason why we're really concerned about methane right now is that human beings have put too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's heated up the planet and that's a, creating a tipping point where we're seeing things like the permafrost melt. Well, when the permafrost melts is the perfect anaerobic conditions for any of the organisms up there to burp out that methane. And so then that is a runaway effect on the climate. The methane in the atmosphere heats up the planet more, melts more permafrost, right? It's catastrophe, it's looming catastrophe. Um, that if we don't address it, then we're talking about a couple billion humans are gonna be displaced on this planet. And how are we gonna deal with all of those refugees? All of our lives will be affected. Like it's a real gloom and doom thing. Unless we say, wait, if it can tip the wrong direction, we can tip it the right direction. We have the capacity. We have an accumulated knowledge base to go in and say, let's draw down some of this carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. Let's turn off the fossil fuel emissions as much as possible, as rapidly as possible. You know, agriculture gets blamed for a lot. Agriculture contributes about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. 
right? It's, it's how we generate our power. It's our transportation. It's a lot of other things that, that are really pouring all of these fossil fuel um, emissions into the atmosphere. But agriculture and restoration of ecosystems can be the solution to the whole problem, right? If we utilize these methods that we teach at the Soil Food Web School to get the carbon back in the soil, entangling soil particles with fungi, if we do this on a large scale, John mentioned that plants cool an area. That's very true. Dee Dee Penhouse uh, has also got a soil sponge workshop where she talks about the positive tipping point, right? We've uh, my whole life. I've been living in a world that's hitting all these negative tipping points, and I would love to see us get enough people on board to go in the right direction. And so like, that's my soapbox for the day. <laughs> we can do it. I believe we can do it, but we have to teach people that it's been going this way and we've got to invest in it going that way. That's a, a great statement to add to the end of that question, there, Adam. If I could add just one short thing that might be useful for, for people is that uh, we can alter the surface temperatures. Mm -hmm. And by altering the surface temperatures in, in microclimates, we can then change the moisture. And when we change the moisture, there's one thing that I've been noticing that is the atmospheric moisture and the, and the soil moisture, they attract each other. So if you, if you have moist soils with vegetation and biodiversity, you're gonna have more clouds, then you're gonna have more rain, you're gonna have nucleation, the, the exudates, the ex exhalation um, adds bacteria, which becomes the nuclei for cloud formation and for precipitation. Well, that's exactly what we need to do. And we need, we need everybody to understand that because we can't say, well, um, you know, it's a big problem. It has nothing to do with me and I can just go do whatever I want. We all need to understand this. And we all need to participate in this. And then, then it's solvable. I agree. And in fact, John, I think you teed us up for the next question perfectly, uh, which is from Derek. And Derek asks, can the panel speak to suggested actions for the average person to take? I think one of the biggest issues is awareness, especially here on the Canadian prairies. Basically, we need to have the average person turn their lawn into gardens where they grow food. Um, make your own high nutrient uh, concentration food resources for yourself. We have to remove those laws that say you can only have grass in your front lawn. You can, you know, you can't grow food because it looks messy. We got to change that perception. You know, it's ugly. The the ugliest condition you could have your uh, um, soil around your house is uh, in grass. Um, little patches, are, oh, okay, fine, you know, but let's get everybody growing their own food again, just like we did back in World War II, because I think the, you know, everything is a lot more scary now than it ever was with the problems of uh, World War II. We got to grow our own. Food forest everywhere. Exactly. I, I think I think the food forest is the right the right idea because it's not just production, it's more functional. So the the thing that we haven't seen, I think you can eat wild too. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of interesting things. If you if you haven't tried the lemonade berries. Out, out in California, you've just got to have those. They are crazy. They're so packed with, uh, with vitamin C. You just, you, you, you eat one and it just like explodes in your mouth. It's wonderful. And I mean, that kind of stuff, that's what we need. Those are nutrient, that's nutrient density. I mean, if the bears are headed for it, you want it too. <laughs> Before the bears get there. Well, right. you don't want to do it. You, you don't want to try to take it away from the bear. From the bear. Right. I'll fight you for it, bear. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that a lot of people feel disempowered 
and uh, overwhelmed by the, the problem. And I think the average person actually has a tremendous amount of power to make this change. One, we talked about growing your own food. You know, for the vast majority of people, uh, you can grow your own food. It, 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 even if you live in an apartment, you have a balcony box, growing your own herbs and some amount of food is, is still fantastic. And then I think the other way is the choices that you make, you know, eat seasonally, eat locally, uh, find foods that are, are grown in your area and not being shipped all the way around the world, uh, impacting climate change and, and you know, um, a whole other slew of, of challenges that come with that whole globalization of the food sources. So I, I think the average person, you know, can make a big difference. It's kind of like the whole scenario of people say, oh, what does my vote count? Why should I vote? You know, I'm just one in, you know, a million or a billion or whatever else. Well, if everybody has that thought, then sure, you're not going to be able to get anywhere. But it's each individual's, I think, duty or role to realize that this is existentially going to impact you in some way or your children's or your family, and you really need to deal with it. So... All right, anybody else want to add anything to this question? Okay, well, let's move on. Well, I, there was one comment in the chat that was mm -hmm. uh, kind of negative about all the work it takes to grow plants and it's so much effort. Well, that tells me right off the bat that you aren't dealing with soil. You've got dirt. You're trying to grow plants in, your, in dirt. Ain't going to do well at all. You're not going to get the nutrition that you require what you have to do is get this biology back in the soil. And basically once you've got these organisms functioning and working in your soil, you don't ever have to do anything except plant the seeds and harvest the plants. You shouldn't have any diseases. You shouldn't have pests. You shouldn't have uh, weeds if you have the biology right in the soil. So, you know, what I like to say to my growers is we'll, we'll get this work done in the, in the springtime and then you'll walk away and go fishing for the rest of the summer. So plants should grow themselves, basically. If we set the ecosystem up to grow these plants, they will grow with us without us having to interfere. And it will be chock full of nutrients. Your kids will be able to get by on one single tomato <laughs> for lunch because they're so full, their body is saying, okay, you've, you've given me all my nutrients. Let's go play. Agreed. Okay, we've got time for one more question. I'm gonna skip past this one and I'm gonna to go to here. And I think this is a great one for us to end with. And Adam, this one was directed towards you. This is from Jackie. And I think all the, the panelists can have uh, some say in this as well. But uh, specifically, Adam, do you see food production as compatible with ecosystem restoration or is it more important to restore to more or less original wild habitat? Also, if food production is part of these types of systems, how far can this go towards feeding the world without needing ever more intense and or tech heavy production systems? Mm. This is a great one. So we have a lot of people on this planet and I'm not gonna suggest that we reduce the number of people we have on this planet. And so we need a lot of land to feed people but we have a system globally that has looked at this problem and modeled it out based on its own internal ideas about how productive that land can be, about where in the world we can produce food, about how we can um, blend food production with natural systems. And it is a very industrial, colonial, style of thinking that is predominant in agricultural research areas around the world. And I'll admit that before I came to the Soil Food Web School, I was much more in that paradigm myself, a product of those same systems, looked at the problem with that one lens. And I've learned that there are other ways to look at the problem. And I believe that we can blend food forest and native forest together and that both will do better, right? And it's not an easy answer because as John said, everywhere in the world, the solutions have to arise in different ways, but I'll give one um, metaphor. I don't know if anyone has ever seen what a flock of starlings 
looks like when it flies. But it's called a murmuration, and they they kind of look like an amoeba, right? They move around in all these different directions, and they seem to work as one organism. But research has shown that actually maybe only 15% of the starlings are deciding to change directions. So to me, it's about humans. It's about us finding the 15% of the world that wants to change and resourcing them with training. Again, this is why I'm at Soil Food Web School, because we're training people that want to be part of the change. And I love being on these webinars because we're talking to people that want to be part of the change. And it does not take 80% of humans to change, to change the world. Maybe it only takes 15%, right? If we get the true leaders out there. So we can start looking at these problems from different lenses if we get enough people at the table and talk about all the different possible solutions. Use airplanes in one place to spread soil biology, put it on seeds in another place, um, go in with backpack sprayers in another place. It takes human ingenuity and innovation of people that see that land is something that we belong to. I think when we get to that tipping point of human perspective, we're going to see the world change. Great. John? Yeah, if, if, if I could just add to that, when, when they were working in the Lus Plateau, they had this crazy idea that they just had to have agriculture everywhere. And so they were like 100% agriculture on the sides of hills, tops of mountains. I mean, every place, it just, they were trying everything. And they had nothing, you know, so they got no, no yield whatsoever. And they, when they took out 50, 60, maybe more uh, percent of the land for ecology, they had massive increases in productivity in the remainder of the land. They increased productivity by reducing the area in cultivation. You know, and I mean, when I saw that, I was like, oh, wow, you know, this is so off the scale different than we're being taught. But if you degrade the natural systems and you don't have a functional hydrological cycle, you don't have the fungus and the bacteria and you don't have the biodiversity, you really don't have productivity. So the idea of running to these monocultures and then throwing defense chemicals, you know, for our, or, or military chemicals from leftover surplus military chem chemicals on agriculture is, you know, nuts, just completely nuts. So let's not do that anymore. And let's, uh, let's collectively think about what we have to do. And let's recognize the real value of that. Wow, well said. I always Elaine? tend to I always tend to think of uh, all of the problem organisms are just messages from mother nature, if you will. When you start to lose productivity within the soil because the microorganisms are no longer present to do these various things, then that plant doesn't have the energy to uh, run its own immune system. And so now the plant is much more susceptible to all of these uh, pests and problem organisms. And so nature essentially is, this, is sending these problem organisms to say, hey, wake up, uh, you know, um, human being, you're, you're not running your system correctly. You're, you're forgetting this part and we don't pay any attention or we go out and we grab something that's gonna kill all of those particular uh, organisms, instead of taking home the actual message, we're trying to get around it. We're trying to sneak around mother nature. And so what does mother nature do? She goes in and makes certain a nastier message comes through the system and you're gonna lose more of your crop. And what do we do? We respond by getting nastier and stronger toxic chemicals to kill those problems with. Whereas if we would just stop and listen to what nature is trying to tell us, we fix the real problem. And then we don't have to worry about insect pests and problem organisms and weeds and things like that. 
So how long can, is Mother Nature going to put up with human beings doing stupid, arrogant things? Yeah, I think we're real close to that point where nature finally is going to say, out, out, you know, punk kick them out the door. She doesn't need us. We need her, but we, she doesn't need us. So uh, now's the time. This is our last chance to pay attention and fix the problems we've been bringing on ourselves. I have a feeling in our war with nature, we're definitely going to be the, uh, the losers in that battle. <laughs> Ultimately, Mother Nature will uh, prevail if humanity can't get our, our stuff together. Okay, um, well, I say let's go ahead and uh, close out today's webinar. Uh, one last thing I'd like to do is uh, just uh, review quickly about our upcoming webinar series. So we have webinar two, Ecosystem Re Restoration Examples. And again, that's 11 a.m. on Friday, uh, July 15th, not 17th, 15th. And then uh, webinar three, our main event um, on saving our soils and ecosystems at 10 a.m. on Thursday, July 21st. And then webinar four, how can you impact your ecosystem, careers in ecosystem restoration and regenerative ag? And that's 11 a.m. on Thursday, July 28th. Um, I'd like to thank um, all of the people working behind the scenes in the Soil Food Web School to put these webinars together. It is definitely a, a large team effort to pull off webinars of this size and scale. Um, and I'd also like to thank our panelists so thank you so much, John, for, for agreeing to be part of this and sharing your knowledge and really kind of, uh, you know, promoting and pushing how we can do uh, ecosystem restoration at a large, large scale. And I'd like to thank uh, Adam and Elaine. Um, always your, your information, your knowledge uh, is so invaluable uh, for the work that we do and really being able to, to share that knowledge with, with everybody on the webinar today is fantastic. And thank you, so, Brian, for being the host for all of this. Uh, you got to kind of be on top of everything and be aware where we're going. And so you do an amazing job. And I, too, want to say thank you to all of our behind the scenes folks, because we couldn't do this without them. For sure. OK, with that being said, uh, we're going to go ahead and close today's webinar. Thank you, uh, audience. And uh, we'll see you on the next webinar. Cheers. Bye, Cheers, everybody. Ciao. Thank you so much. Don't, Don't forget, forget to click, click that like button. Bye. 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 Bye.